is Marcelo La Rosa and Marlon Dumas. They really don't need any introduction. All of you know them, and you, well, all of you are familiar with their work. They, they've just published a book, Business Process Management, which is an excellent book, along with video lectures and so on. Uh, yesterday, they won the Best Paper Award, both of them. Uh, and, you know, I can't recount. I can give you the whole list of all the honors and awards they won, but uh, Marcello is a professor, associate professor at Queensland University of Technology, and uh, Marlon is a professor at University of Tartu. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I was told that I speak too loud, so I will not use the microphone, okay? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And uh, this is dedicated to you guys, the brave you are st who are staying until the end of the conference. Thank you. Without you, this workshop would make no sense. All right, let's start. So this workshop is about a method, a step-by-step -step method to turn conceptual process models into executable process ones. So we want to take a process model that has been designed typically by business analysts for requirement analysis, for communication purposes, and convert that into an executable process model. An executable process model is a model that can be deployed to a system, a business process management system, and can be automatically enacted by such a system, such that essentially the system takes care of coordinating the endover of work between the various resources that are involved in this process like a participant that has to perform certain tasks, would be presented with a web form. They can see all the tasks in a queue, they can pick one and essentially fill out their respective form. But the BPMS, this tool, actually offers a number of capabilities, like has a number of capabilities, like for example providing analytics on real time as well as on post-execution about the performance of these business processes. Well, a lot of literature is available on both sides of this cake, right? There is a lot of work that has been done on how to define conceptual process models. A lot of work has been done, for example, on guidelines, for setting guidelines like labeling conventions or layout conventions at the level of the uh, conceptual process model to enhance the readability of this diagram or pitfalls of process models. On the other end, again, a lot of work has been done in order to, you know, specify the properties, the execution properties of an executable process model. But what we found out is that there is a gap between the two. And typically, the so-called ATAMO procedure takes place, as uh, Sharp and McDermott have phrased it. So, and then a miracle, of course. So, this tutorial is precisely about this miracle. How can we make that transition a bit more concrete? So what we are going to do is that we are going to present a five-step method to incrementally transform the conceptual process model that we get from business analysts into an executable process model that can be automatically enacted by a business process management system. So this tutorial is for BPM practitioners seeking to understand and finally fill the gap the between the business side and the IT side, the business side proper of the conceptual process model and the IT side proper of the executable one. For instructors and teachers, for example, you'll see that the content of this tutorial, which we sell for $50, just kidding, will be available on a website, can be used for teaching purposes, like for example, as um, uh, one of the last classes of a course on process modeling, where you can say, what can happen beyond the concept of process modeling, like automation, or as an introductory class for a course on business process automation. It is also addressing the needs of researchers, us, working on both sides of the problem, on the conceptual side and on the executable one. All right, so let's see where actually this transformation from conceptual to executable process model should take place in the context of the BPM life cycle. And as you know, when we talk about a BPM life cycle, there is no one single, one single approach describing the life cycle. Like if you Google BPM life cycle, that's what you get. I Googled that in Australia. I'm not sure what I would get here in China. But <laughs> the idea is that you get a number of diagrams. There are certain approaches that see BPM as a three-phase one, as a four-phase one, 
as a five phase, phase one, and some that go a bit overboard with 12 or more steps. Anyway, what we can do is that at least we can distill seven key phases in the BPM life cycle. We start with process identification. So in process identification, we want to identify the business processes that fulfill our improvement requirements. So we have certain ideas. If we want to improve certain business processes and we want to identify those business processes that are going to serve our purpose. The result of this phase is a process architecture where we organize our business processes hierarchically as well as we define the dependencies, the order dependencies between these processes. Once this phase has been concluded, then we can kick off the discovery phase. This is a very important phase because in the discovery phase, we want to understand actually this business process that we have documented at the level of a box here in the process architecture. We want to properly document them as conceptual process models. So the result of discovery is an assist process model. And discovery can be done in different ways. There are different approaches, for example, by interviews, by running workshops, by inferring information from documents available in the organization, as well as we all know and are very keen on through automated process discovery, through process mining techniques. Then in the process analysis, we use both qualitative and quantitative analysis techniques in order to get insights on the weaknesses of our business processes and the impact of such weaknesses on our organization. And then we can use this to define, identify, and implement opportunities for improvement. So in order to fix these issues. And the result of this is a so-called to-be process model, which is still at the conceptual level, but where a number of identified issues have been resolved by means of this improvement phase. Then there is the process implementation step. Here we can actually implement the process is effectively within the organization. And here there are two options. We can implement the processes manually, for example, by kicking off a change management plan within the organization, or what is actually the focus of this uh, tutorial, we can implement them by means of a BPMS. So we can actually turn these to be process models into executable process models. And then we can use capabilities offered by the BPMS as I was mentioning to you before, to check the conformance of these processes and get insights on the performance of this process. So we actually want to focus on this process implementation phase. And this is unfortunately, as I was saying before, a well-known gap in BPM. Because on the one hand, we have business analysts, domain experts, process owners, the work on the production of this artifact, the 2B process model. On the other end, we have another target audience, solution architects, developers, system administrators, who manage the system and create such artifacts, the executable process model. So conceptual process models, conceptual 2B process models, are made by domain experts for a specific set of objectives, communication purposes, requirements analysis, understanding among stakeholders. So they need to be easy to understand. What does it mean? It means that often we will see that in these conceptual process models, we neglect, we explicitly neglect details that are not relevant for the sake of discussion, for the sake of communication, for the sake of requirement analysis. So they must be intuitive and as such, they may leave room for interpretation. So they may contain ambiguities. On the other hand, we've got the executable counterpart of these conceptual process models. They are made by IT experts, like developers, like uh, uh, solution architects who design the solution and the boundaries of such solution. And they need to provide input uh, to a process enactment system, the BPMS. As such, they need to be machine readable. So they must be precise. There cannot be ambiguities, otherwise there will be issues in interpreting this artifact, this specification, by the BPMS, which is a machine. So as such, they will contain a number of details that are only relevant for this implementation, for the execution. Right. So what, we're gonna, what we are going to do is that we are going to present a five-step method by means of which we will actually reach an intermediate artifact that sits in between the conceptual to be process model and the executable one, which we will call to be executed process model. 
it's like an intermediary step that where we are getting into the transformation of the conceptual model to the executable, but we are not quite there. Right, let's take a look at this approach indeed. This is an approach actually that has been inspired by work, by teaching material from Remco Dijkman from Technical University of Eindhoven. Right, so it's made up of five steps. We start by identifying the automation boundaries. Then we review manual tasks. We complete the process model. We adjust the granularity of the tasks in this process model. And finally, we specify execution properties. Okay, now, so the first four steps will lead to the to be executed process model. This intermediate artifact that I was talking about. And this will be covered in part one. Now, after the break, Marlon will take over and will focus on the last mile, which is the specification of the execution properties. All right, let's start with our running example. So this is a BPMN model, a BPMN 2.0 model, and I assume everyone is more or less familiar with this language. If you are not, can you please leave the room now? <laughs> Just kidding. All right, so we are going to take an order fulfillment process, and we are going to focus on the seller. So this is a process that takes place between a seller that fulfills orders received by a customer, received from a customer, and interacts with a couple of suppliers for the sake of getting raw materials that can be used to manufacture products in case such product that has been ordered by the customer is not available. Now, in our implementation exercise, we have to pick a party, a business party that we want to implement. And in our case, we are going to select the seller. So we are going to focus on the context of this pool. Let's take a closer look at it. So this process takes place at the seller organization. And the seller organization has these two departments. The sales department that handles invoicing and the financial aspects of fulfilling an order. And the warehouse and distribution, within which there is an ERP system, so some software system that uh, sits within this department in this organization. So the process starts upon the receipt of a purchase order. And then we check the stock availability. So here what we do is that we interact uh, with the warehouse database in order to check whether the product that has been ordered is actually available, is in stock in the warehouse. Now, if it is available, we simply retrieve that from the shelf, and then we can confirm the order. If that is not available, then we get to go through another way. We need to check the supplier's catalog, so check raw materials availability to see what supplier actually has that particular raw material or set of raw materials that is required for manufacturing the, pro the, the, the product. So once we've got that, uh, we can contact the suppliers. Let's assume that here raw materials are available at supplier one. So we request raw materials, obtain such raw materials, finally we can manufacture the product, and we can confirm the order. Now, once we have confirmed, yes, I'm very proud of this animation. Once we've confirmed the order, then in parallel, in the warehouse, we can ship, get the shipping address from the customer and ship the product. Whereas on the sales department, where we have confirmed the order, we can emit the invoice, receive the payment, and finally, once both branches have completed, we can archive order, and then the order has been fulfilled. So an instance of this process completes. Right, so guys, if there is any question, please uh, interrupt me and ask me. Okay, I can charge you a small fee, but I guarantee you'll get an answer. All right, so let's start with the first step. Identify the automation boundaries. So we, we actually um, have a principle behind each of these steps that essentially will tell us how we have to operate in the context of this particular step. So what we have to do. So here... The first step is identify the automation boundaries. And the principle is that not all processes can be automated. I mean, we have to be honest. Trying to automate all processes in our organization is never going to work. And the problem is that if we embark ourselves in such a journey of trying to automate a process that is not actually prone to automation, and we will find that out later on in the project, then that is going to be very expensive because we have to roll back and we wasted a lot of time. So the idea of this method is to understand in advance 
whether the process that we are examining is actually prone to automation. And to do that, we need to establish the automation boundaries. We need to understand what can be automated and what should be left out. And if everything turns out that has to be left out, then that process is clearly not a candidate for automation. So, in order to do that, we have to identify the task type. In BPM, and, but more in general, in, um, when it comes to automating a business process, we can identify three tasks. Automated tasks, user tasks, and manual tasks. Automated tasks are those tasks whose execution is demanded to an external application that typically sits within the IT landscape of our organization. Like, for example, we want to check the availability of certain items, so whether they are in stock or not. And we could use an application that is offered by the ERP system of our organization, like an inventory information service that's typically available as, part, as, a, as a package in the uh, ERP system. So then the BPMS delegates work to this external application, typically through a service interface. So that's an automated task. There is no human involved. On the other end, in the user task, we need to get input from a process participant. So not anymore from an application, but rather from a human being. For example, a clerk and a financial officer has to manually approve an invoice. So typically, the BPMS gets input from participants through the use of web forms, as I was mentioning to you before. So the user is uh, presented a web form. They will fill that out and submit the results, the content, back to the BPMS. Finally, we've got manual tasks, like working the land. But more in general, for example, we've got a manual task like um, uh, sending a product, or packaging um, a package that has to be shipped, or shipping a product. These are typically manual tasks. Right, so in BPMN, we identify the type of task with an icon on the top left corner. Like, this is the user task, we've got a little man, Manual task, we have a hand, and then there are actually four subtypes of the automated task. There is the service task, that's what I was alluding to before. So we delegate the execution of the task to an external application, which exposes its functionality by means of a service interface, like a WSDL fa uh, file uh, that describes the operations that are performed by this particular application. Then we've got the script task. Now, if this is an external execution, external to the BPMS, the script task is internal. So it is like a piece of code that is used to perform some typically simple operations for which we do not need to access an external application. Like, for example, we get a number of quotes from a number of suppliers and we want to select the best one. Or we want to compute the insurance premium of a particular claimant or its Medicare benefit. Then send task and receive task are two subtypes of the service task. This is used for automatic notification, like we want to send an email, or we want to put a post, we want to Twitter a message, or post something on Facebook. Or receive task, that's for receiving notification, like we receive uh, a message, or um, a message that, for example, could be exchanged with an external application. All right, now let's go back to our example and let's identify the type of tasks. So, the first one is check stock availability. So this is clearly an automated task because here the idea is to interact with this inventory information service that communicates with the warehouse database within the warehouse department. But also, check raw materials availability is another example. It's very similar, actually. So, but this time, we interact with the supplier's catalog. Now, this uh, task will be color-coded, so in blue we represent automated task, in red user task, and in green manual one, but red doesn't necessarily mean bad, okay? So, manufacture product is another example of a service task. Why is that? Any idea? I mean, manufacture product sounds like a manual task, right? Yeah? Precisely. So what we want to capture at the level of an executable process model is the interaction between tasks. 
And here, manufactured product, the product could, could actually be manufactured by a manufacturing plant that exposes its functionality through a service interface with which this BPMS is talking, right? So that is clearly a service task. And then here we have a couple of examples of receiving. Uh, so, yes? Yes, another option, this is a possible solution. Another option is that we put a user task. In that case, the user would be notified with a form that a particular product needs to be produced. Then they will manually turn on the plant or start the manufacturing process. And once that has been completed, then they will notify completion through the same form. So th that's another option. But we are getting into the point of the second uh, um, uh, second step in this method, which is the review of the manual tasks. So then, here we have a task, retrieve product from warehouse. So this is a manual task. The um, warehouse um, um, operator, the warehouse operator has to manually pick up this uh, product from a shelf in the warehouse. And then similarly, obtain raw materials is another example of a manual task. And here, confirm order is an example of a user task. So here, uh, somebody within sales, like an order manager, receives an order in electronic form, checks the status of this order, so checks that everything is in order, and then can confirm that order. Right, once we've done that, uh, for all the tasks in, uh, in this business process, we need to take the manual tasks and review them in order to find opportunities for supporting such tasks by means of some IT system, because the principle here is that if it can't be seen by the BPMS, then it simply doesn't exist. So even if I've got a manual task within my process, if I cannot find a way to hook up this manual task with the BPMS, then the BPMS is not going to be able to see that manual task, hence it's not going to be able to move on once the manual task has been started. Actually, the BPMS will not even know when the manual task will be started. We'll only know when the task just before the manual task has completed. All right, so there are two options here. We can turn a manual task into a user task, or we can turn that into an automated task. Let's consider the example of uh, uh, retrieve of task, retrieve product from warehouse. So here we've got this warehouse worker that manually goes to the shelf and picks up the package. So one option is to turn this man into a nice looking woman that receives a notification through a user form, as in the example before, goes and manually picks the package from the shelf, and then, once that has been done, inserts the information into the user's form and submits the button. Now, note that the task hasn't changed. The task is still a manual task. The lady, for as beautiful as she is, she has to manually go and pick this package, or she may ask the man to do so. But in the end, the idea is to be able to synchronize with the BPMS, so to hook up this task with the BPMS by means of a user task, so by means of a user form. Another, uh, perhaps more clever option, is actually to replace that with a sequence of a receive task, sorry, a send task and a receive task. So first, this nice lady could just go around the warehouse and she receives on her smartphone a notification by email that she's got a new package to pick up. And she goes around, reaches the shelves, asks the men to pick up the package, and once she's made sure that the package has been put where it has to be put, then with a barcode scanner, she scans the package, and that barcode scanner is connected to the BPMS, so that automatically notifies the BPMS that the package has actually been picked up. And that would be receive pickup confirmation. So essentially, the barcode scanner sends through an interface a notification to the BPMS. So that's another option. And of course, in this case, it's more convenient for the lady because she doesn't even need to fill out any form, right? She just needs to scan a code. <coughs> any questions so far? Right. At this stage, to my student, I would say that this is a great opportunity for asking you questions at the exam. The other option is to isolate this task and automate the rest. So let's take a look at this example, student admission process. So um, let's assume the students that want to get admitted at unit, you know, typically actually go through this process. So let's assume that this starts 
with an application that has been submitted electronically by a student. Then an admin officer checks application for completeness. And then somebody else verifies, another admin office, sir, verifies the English language test. If the test is valid, is not valid, the application is rejected. If the test is valid, then the application is put in a batch such that these applications from different candidates are collected and at the meeting day, the committee, the assessment committee meets to assess the application and then the result is that the application may be rejected or accepted. But let's take a look at this ad hoc multi-instance task. This is actually containing four manual tasks that can almost take place in any order, apart from this precedence relation. Now, for all batched applications, until all applications have been assessed, we need to convert the student's grades to a local system, if the student is foreigner, check student's academic transcript, discuss a student's application, and read the referee's reports. Now, as we can see, this is a bunch of manual tasks that can take place in any order and can occur even multiple times, each of these tasks. So it makes no sense to try to enforce some handover of work that is automatically coordinated by a BPMS behind these four tasks, because there are people involved here, and these relations are essentially taking place on an ad hoc basis, right? Based on the number of applications that they receive, based on the people that are there, etc. So what is the idea here? The idea is essentially to carve this part out of the automation equation and try to automate the segment before and the segment <coughs> after this uh, manual task, leaving the task as is, so taking the task pretty much out of the BPMS. So the segment one will finish once all applications have been matched, the segment two would be the actual assessment of the application. And the segment three would be the automatic notification of the result to the student. So here we put a user task, update student record, where the admin officer takes all the results of all the various applications that have been assessed and one by one reports this information into the system by using the BPMS, upon which then the only thing that the BPMS has to do is to send a bunch of notification. Right, so this is an example where instead of automating the whole lot, we have actually decided to divide the process into, two fra into three fragments, out of which one, it will be entirely left out of the BPMS control. Why do you prefer this solution instead of transforming the manual task? It depends. I mean, this is not necessarily the best solution. It's just an alternative to the one that we saw before. So here, the difference with the other example is that this is actually a more complex manual task that may take a lot of time, may take days, may even take months, because there is, uh, uh, for example, a, a given due date for the assessment of the application. So rather than keeping the process as a single one, we could split that into two different segments. Uh, well, perhaps a more general answer is that you have to consider the trade-off uh, between the workers stopping their work to report that they have completed a task all the time, and we're talking about lots of tasks because there are lots of applications and you have to use this for each application, and the benefit that you get by knowing that this has been done. So how much benefit do you get by knowing that, uh, that one member of the committee has looked at one application? So in the middle of the part segment three after you someone reports the uh, segment two as well. Yeah, the, and, and that's the what's whole, exactly, that's exactly. You, you, need, you need to get reports as well. You you need to get so you look at the at the la latest point key. at the point where you really need to know that the that, that phase is finished. You know, that, that complete piece of work is finished. Yeah. In a way it's every interaction uh, that you impose for the user has to be thought in terms of what are the costs and the benefits that it will bring to you. So this is an example where we may take this manual task out. There are other examples where automation is not really the solution. Like if you take a post-production process that takes place once, for example, a movie has been shot, that is a highly creative process where there are activities like 
run spotting session where people meet like the director the producer the editor meet to decide on where we should have the effects where the music soundtrack should kick in etc these are highly creative and ad hoc processes for which automation is not going to provide any benefits so in these cases then essentially it makes no sense to try to enforce some automation on these processes right let's Let's take another example, and maybe we can get the solution together. So this is a prescription fulfillment process. So it takes place at a pharmacy, it's actually taken from a real case study, and the pharmacy has uh, the ambition of implementing this by means of a pharmacy management system, which we can consider as a BPMS, because it provides automation capabilities. All right, so the process starts once the prescription passes the insurance check. Then it is assigned to a technician who collects the drugs from the shelves and put them in a bag with the prescription in stapled into it, right? So here, what tasks can we identify? So how does this process start? Insurance check. Yes, so first we need to check the insurance and then and then we need to deal with drugs, right? Yeah, you like that. So, check insurance, <laughs> collect drug from shelves. So, collect drug from shelves is what the technician would do. So, once this is, is been done, the bag is passed to the pharmacist who double checks that the prescription has been filled correctly. So, here is pretty clear. What is the task? We, we double check. So, there's a quality check taking place, and that's done by the pharmacist. After this quality check, the pharmacist seals the bag and puts that into the pickup area. So again, here we've got a sealed bag and not to pick up area. When a customer arrives to pick up the prescription, a technician retrieves the prescription and asks the customers for their payment. So what tasks do we have here? Payment? Yeah, so we've got a task Yes, so to get the, the prescription, a treat prescription back, and another one, collect payment. All right, it now, depends, yes? Because of also, it depends on, a little bit also on the level of abstraction. Clearly. If you want to consider the way you just transfer information, what means pass. And Precisely. you want to support that. Precisely, well, yes, so you could go one level down. Also, this could be split, seal bank, and not to pick up area. I put it the same because that's a manual task performed by the same um, participant, which is the, um, the pharmacist. All right, so let's take a look at each of these tasks with the intent of automating this business process by means of this pharmacy management system. So check insurance, is that something that could be automatically done? Right, so that could be done indeed by our BPMS. So the insurance could be automatically checked based on the prescription and on the insurance policy of the customer. So that's a service task. Collect drugs from shelves. That's, 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 that's a manual task. And we can see, let's, let's first identify the, the task type, right? So that's a manual task. Then check quality. That's another example of a manual sorry, task. Sorry for my Yes, sure. And this is one problem that usually you have when you try to do this, is that, for instance, collecting the things is manual, but sometimes you cannot ignore the technology, because if you already know that you have a, a warehouse that's completely automated, yeah. this could be a service. Yeah, and, so and you have all these questions, um, where, I, where I know about where the, the business process is going to be implemented. Yeah, that's exactly where I'm heading. So I want to show that indeed, we can turn that into a user task where we can benefit from the information that's retrieved from the BPMS. So here I'm just trying to perform the first step, identify the task types as is. And then based on that, I can isolate the manual task and see whether I can find a way to support them by means of IT. Of course, you can do this too in one step. So seal bag is another example of a manual task like is this retreat prescription bag, where I collect payment as well. So the guy takes the money from, uh, from the customer. So now if we want to review this, uh, collect drugs from shelves is indeed something where we could use a user task. So the technician here would receive a form with the prescription. They would print, for example, our 
barcode, and then once they've collected the drug from the shelves, they will stick the barcode into the drug and then scan that with a barcode scanner. That's what actually happens in reality at a pharmacy. We see these people playing with this adhesive tape, with this adhesive tape, right? They stick it out, they stick it on. That's precisely what's happening. They are synchronizing this manual task with the backend system that is supporting this process. Now, check quality is again another example of a manual task that could be supported by means of a user task. In that case, the pharmacist is notified that there is a new prescription to be checked, then checks that everything is all right with the insurance, with the dosage for that particular customer, and then seals the bag and hands that to the pickup area. So again here, what we could do is that we could get rid of that activity and hide that behind the checking of the quality because that's an activity that always is performed once the quality has been checked. So the pharmacist themselves could scan again the product, to, so, so the drug, to notify the BPMS that uh, the quality has been checked and that the bag has been sealed and been put in the pickup area. So again, that's another way of synchronizing with a BPMS. Then retrieve prescription bag is something that the technician does. Right? That's a manual task. You have to pick this. But you can synchronize that with a BPMS, for example, by using the following task, the collect payment. So how do we typically pay? We pay, for example, through one of these little machines, this uh, point of sale by swiping a card. So that could actually be a service task. And the manual operation of retrieving the prescription bag and handing that over to this customer would be synchronized with the BPMS once the payment has been received. So essentially, the, all the BPMS needs to know is that the payment has been received to understand that everything in between that was required in order to get the payment has been done, because we know that the customer would never pay unless they've got their drugs. So that's precisely the idea of getting rid of some of the manual tasks. So now we can see how this process can be automated. So we've got a pharmacy with a BPMS, a technician, and a pharmacist. So the process starts when a new prescription is received, upon which automatically the BPMS checks for insurance. And here we could have a system that collects prescription, but that's out of the scope of this example. Then the technician receives a notification on their screen or whatever device they are using. They go, manually collect drugs from shelves, and report through scanning the barcode back to the BPMS to let the BPMS know that this activity has been completed. Then the pharmacist can check the quality of this prescription. Of course, if the quality is not OK, then the technician would have to change the, the drug, so for example, the dosage or whatever is involved with the quality. If it is okay, once the customer has arrived, has paid, has been handed over the medicines, then the system automatically collects the payment upon which the prescription has been fulfilled. So as you can see, there are basically four out of the six tasks uh, that we saw before, four tasks that are relevant from the perspective of the BPMS. And, uh, the handover, an automatic coordination of handover between these tasks done by a BPMS would then be beneficial for this pharmacy. All right, in this second step, when we review this manual task, we should actually also look at further BPMN constructs that cannot be supported by a BPMS. So besides manual tasks as such, there is a list of other elements that cannot be supported by the BPMS that are not supported by the BPMS. Physical data objects in example is an example of that. If you have an invoice on a piece of paper, or even sometimes we even represent a fax or a, a phone call, all these physical data objects cannot be parsed clearly by the BPMS. And as well as messages bearing physical data objects. Data stores is another element that is typically not interpreted by a BPMS. OK, we understand physical data stores, like a cabinet in the pharmacy containing all the drugs. But how about electronic data stores? I mean, we know that electronic data, store, electronic data objects have to be used by the BPMS. But how about these electronic 
data stores, like for example the warehouse database or the supplier's catalog. The reason why they are typically discarded by the BPMS as a piece of element, you know, as a, as a notation in, in, in your diagram, is because um, the interaction with these data objects is not taking place directly with the BPMS. The BPMS is actually contacting a service which in turn is interacting with, is accessing these data stores. For example, we contact the inventory information service, which in turn has an interface to talk to the underlying warehouse database. So that typically the BPMS will never directly talk to a database. There will always be an adapter in between or a connector like MySQL adapter or an Oracle connector, etc. So that's the reason why we can safely remove these data objects. Pulls and lanes, it may sound strange, but this is another example of elements that are not interpreted by a BPMS, typically. Why that? Well, pools is simple, because we want to implement one specific party, so we focus on that party. So it makes no sense to represent other pools. Now, some tools allow you to do so, but they don't actually interpret this information. Whereas other, another class of tools, they just allow you to represent a single pool. For your own records, you know, to know where this business process that you are trying to execute, to automate, sits within your organization, like it is sales. Lanes. Now, lanes are important for the allocation of resources, both human and non-human, to the various tasks. Like we saw an example of uh, an automated, so non-human resource, an automated task, where we had this ERP system, that's a non-human resource. And another one would be the warehouse operator, the warehouse worker within the warehouse, that's a human resource. However, the problem is that lanes are typically used at a conceptual level to indicate resource classes. Like, for example, all the roles within the sales department, all the roles that belong to this particular team or unit, rather than indicating every single resource that will be allocated to each task. Right? Because if we would do that at the conceptual level, then we would clearly be, uh, get a very cluttered diagram. So if you have a relatively large model, you would end up easily having, for example, 40, 50 different lanes. So as a convention, in BPMS vendors have decided typically to ignore this notion and actually allow to some uh, context menu to specify resource allocations at the level of each particular task. Now clearly also text annotations do not bear any semantics, so they are also discarded. Now the important point is the last one. What do we do with these elements? Do we get rid of them or do we neglect them? Now, the advice is that if the BPMS is tolerant to the presence of these elements, and some are, then it's better to leave them on. Because these elements, the presence of these elements, will provide information that will be needed for the automation of the process. For example, I know that I have to pick a role within the sales department to allocate this task to, right? Or a role within the warehouse to allocate this task to. But that information doesn't go beyond that, doesn't go down to the level of single task assignments, typically when we get a conceptual model from, from business analysts. So if it is possible, we should leave them on, but we have to know that essentially we cannot do anything with these elements. Right, then the third step is to complete the process model. Now, for as sophisticated as these intelligent BPM assets can be, they cannot foresee exceptions. And we know that unfortunately exceptions are the rule. It happened for real. Like flights get cancelled, systems crashes, network doesn't work, and we've seen that in China. So we've got these examples where we have issues, and there are two types of exceptions. There are business-related exceptions, and there are technology-related exceptions. A business, an example of a business exception is, for example, the unavailability of a product. The product is discontinued. Or, for example, a customer that sends a cancellation order, right? Or that a customer sending a complaint. Technology-related ones relate to the systems, so to the automated tasks that are involved in our business process. Like, for example, um, a particular service is unreachable, or there is a data 
uh, format validation error, right? So the idea at this level of the business process is actually to try and capture incrementally as many of such exceptions as possible in order to complete the process by covering all these cases, that all these particular situations that happen when the happy, happy path is not taken. So we need to add exception handlers. And then the second thing is that if there is no data, the BPMS is not capable of taking any decision, nor it is of coordinating the endover between tasks. So the second important bit that we need to do in this third step, complete the process model, is to specify all electronic business objects. So we don't need the physical one, but we need to specify all electronic business object because they will be used to end over uh, work from one task to the other as well as they will be used to take decisions in the control flow like to specify the expressions in the sequence flows. Right, let's get back to our example. What can we see here in terms of completion? Like if we test this, uh, this task, check raw materials availability. What can happen during this task? Right, so here, with a single outgoing sequence flow, we are assuming that we are always going to find a supplier where we can get the raw materials from. But how about materials are unavailable? Check the raw materials availability for me is like only checking. if uh, So we receive the answer, no, it's not available, and it's okay. Yeah, it's that, that's fine, but I need to model that. So I could model that with a decision like I did for here, check stock availability, product not in stock or product in stock. And here, check raw materials availability. In this example from the conceptual model, they were assuming that, you know, I just need to get the name of the supplier where these raw materials are contained. So, of course, I could specify a decision, or alternatively, I can get an error message with the information that these uh, um, items are not contained in, uh, these raw materials are not contained in any supplier, and then I notify the unavailability to customer. So it's an alternative way of handling exceptions. This is done explicitly through a decision, and this is done through an error uh, event. But, but we have a rule of thumb. Yes, there is actually. If it is a service task, then everything that comes in the response of the service task, like the service will have an output, that will actually be in the normal flow. So, so I will agree with the reaction to some extent. Mm -hmm. And this example is artificial because the material being unavailable yeah. comes with the normal response. On the other hand, if I send, for example, a, a wrong parameter format, right? Uh, the raw materials expect some identifier of the material, and the identifier is not correct, it has too many zeros or whatever, then uh, the service might throw me back an error. And then that uh, is true. That, that normally will be mapped to an error event. You know, yeah. In the sense you want to see in the law, in the execution law, mm -hmm. that there is an error event that occurred. Yeah, I just think you should uh, change the name because that would um, work with the error event. So if you change the name, then. Um, okay, uh, so I check or raw materials availability or it could yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, just I, I think in that example, indeed, the, 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 the materials unavailable will go in an exhaust split, right? It will be a branch of an exhaust yeah. split, but like uh, a, an error from the service checking raw materials, that could be a, you know, like uh, a, a service call error. That or could data be format exception. error could yeah. be more at the yeah. lower level. Or typically, or typically this could be done when we receive, in the middle of processing an order, we receive an order cancellation from uh, the customer. So we use uh, a catching uh, message event, uh, intermediate catching message event, uh, on the boundary of the task. Then we receive that message, and we may interrupt the task and then process the order cancellation. So yes, thanks for the comment. So any other uh, thing that is missing here, for example, in terms of data objects? Like, for example, how do we take this decision? Can 
So then we have two options. So check stock availability takes purchase order as input and should also use purchase order as output to check the stock or another um, to get the information, to store the information about the stock availability in the purchase order. Or another option, if you don't want to modify the purchase order, is to get a stock availability, like an integer, which will then be used by this expression to check whether the products are not in stock, so whether this is positive or not. And this could be the otherwise option. Again, this is the same for check raw materials availability. We could have a raw materials order list that can then be used to contact the suppliers. Do you um, need uh, to uh, put it so explicitly, like these are just uh, uh, variables in a process? In yeah, the, yeah, so what we are doing at this stage is that we are making all these uh, electronic data objects explicit so that then we can actually model them by means of whatever tool feature is used to capture this information. So this is the to be executed process model, it's still at an intermediate state. Uh, okay. It is an artifact that can still be interpreted by a business analyst, but can be used for the end over of this, uh, uh, of this execution exercise, uh, execution objective from, uh, from the business analyst down to the uh, developers one. So then they essentially, uh, the developers, so this, the diagram is left only with the electronic data objects and then they just need to implement each of them. And that, that pretty much depends on the particular tool that they use. So this to be executed um, artifact, it is still independent, and that's precisely the intention of this, is still independent of a particular, of the concrete BPMS that we are going to use. So at this stage, we specify, we provide <coughs> a specification that is ready to be executed. And in the last mile, the last step, that's when you have to pick a particular BPMS, and based on how the BPMS implements these various constructs, then you do the data mapping. Like, and there, it's again, another thing that you have to choose upon is the language that you're gonna use to specify the type of this. It could be Groovy, it could be Java, it could be JavaScript, depending on the particular implementation of that tool. Right, so this is another example of exception handling, like for example, handle order cancellation. So if we receive an order cancellation request from the customer, we determine the cancellation penalty, for example, based on the duration of the order fulfillment case so far. We notify the penalty to the customer, and if uh, uh, they don't reply within 48 hours, we drop the order cancellation, otherwise they may reply with a stop cancellation request if they are not happy about the penalty, or they continue with the order cancellation request, in which case we cancel order and we trigger a signal, order cancel, which can be picked up by another um, event sub-process, which will charge the penalty to customer and start a compensation routine, for example, if the shipment has already been done and or if the invoicing has already been done to compensate, if these activities have been completed, to compensate for the results of these operations, upon which the order can be fulfilled. Right, so the last step of this um, first part that will allow us to, to get this to be executed process model is to adjust that adjust the task granulite. So here is the, pri the principle is that BPMSs add value only if they can coordinate and manage the handover of work between the resources that are involved in the business process. And we've been saying that for a while. What does that mean? That means that whenever we see two or more consecutive tasks that are actually assigned or meant to be assigned to the same resource, then these are good candidates for aggregation. Like for example, in the context of a claim handling process, clearly it makes no much sense that the same claims handler enters the customer name, the policy number, and the damage details. So we can aggregate these three tasks into one, enter claim, and then essentially this will be different fields of the claim object. But that, sorry, but that, the comp that composition will not depend on the organizational structure. Yeah, so I have, I have an example that will clarify when we may not need to aggregate. Like in this case, we'll see that we will receive, so the same guy, typically is the same guy, the claim center that is supposed to enter all this information. And so trying to enforce a separation 
of all these bits and pieces of information into three separate forms is just going to annoy that person rather than make the work more efficient for that person, right? Because we will see a form with the customer name, a form with the policy number, a form with the damage details. Now, note that we do not have to confuse forms with pages. So by form, we mean a set of pages, right? I can still have here multiple web pages, but all this information will be collected in one form and then sent to the BPMS. But we may have a page flow, so a flow of different pages. So first, I fill out all the customer information, then I fill out the claims details, but they belong all to the same task because they are assigned to the same resource who is going to fill out that form in its entirely in one go. What about if the task has um, uh, documents as input, for instance, a little task? It's uh, extra information that is producing another task. You cannot aggregate it because you don't have necessary information to fill it out. Yes, yeah, so if this information is going to be <coughs> available in between, so after I have, for example, inserted certain data, then it makes no sense to aggregate. So in general, when does it not make sense to aggregate? When, for example, we want to keep track of the progress of this case, and we want to know exactly when each of these cases has been completed. So I'll show you an example where that is actually the case, or where we may want to capture exceptions that are specific to some of these tasks. Like, for example, I want to capture an exception once I receive for, for the receipt of particular information. If I don't receive that information, which is needed, as you were saying, in order to complete this form, then I want to set my um, particular exception handler for that task within this sequence. So this is a rule of thumb, of course. The opposite of this that is that we need to refine tasks, yeah? tasks that are too coarse grain. So for example, if we are, if we have something like that, enter approved money transfer, in the context of a loan assessment process. And so this is uh, assigned to the same loan officer. We might actually want, based on some organizational policies, to split that into two tasks, that even if they are assigned to the same loan officer, we want to enforce a separation of concerns, or a, sorry, a, a 4 i principle, whereby the first one enters the money transfer, and the second one approves that. So that, again, depends on the particular um, business model that is used in that organization, the particular <coughs> policies that are in place. So actually, this is another example where when we want to look for these cases for aggregate, we might actually receive a conceptual process model where there is a sub-optimal order of activities. So in that case, we need to look around and resequence. So for example, prepare acceptance pack could be done by a loan officer, again, in the context of this loan assessment process. And once that is done, send acceptance back. And again, this is a user task, because here all information is prepared and submitted. And then here, once the pack has been sent, then something gets enabled for uh, uh, that uh, loan officer in the form so that they can actually confirm that the pack has effectively been sent. And again, we can use Marco Scanner, etc. Now, this determined insurance premium is a bit in the middle because it's essentially trying to postpone a decision about whether or not the customer is also um, getting some insurance premium. So, to compute the insurance premium is postponing a decision that could have actually been made before. So, I would have had then these two tasks in sequence and uh, Hence, I could have aggregated them. So we need to be careful when, when we want to aggregate tasks because it might not necessarily be a simple sequence of tasks that are assigned to the same resource. The structure could be a bit more involving. And of course, that's something that we have to consider on a process model by process model basis, right? So and this is the case that I was referring to before. Like verified degrees validity is a sub-process within the student assessment process. So once the verification is due, we post documents to agency, receive results from agency, and update student record. Now, we might want to track for auditability purposes all these handovers of work. So when the documents have been posted, for example, we may receive a claim by the student that documents were not posted on time, so the guy couldn't register within the given deadline of the university. Once we receive the results from agency, where we could place an exception, if we don't receive them within two weeks from the agency, then we can get back to the agency. 
and update student records, the final step. So even if they might be performed by the same admin officer, we might want to split, leave them split up. And another thing is that here, there is typically quite some uh, idle time. Like we send this, and then we wait at least two weeks before, say, the Australian Computer Society replies saying that the degree is valid for this student. All right, so it depends on an, a case-by-case -case basis, essentially. All right, so at the end of this four step, we transform, we have transformed a process model, a conceptual process model, into a to be executed process model, where you can see that the model has been significantly extended with exception handlers, with all data objects. We have only focused on one pool, and by the same token, we have decided to remove, we have decided to leave the data objects because in this case, they were uh, supported by, sorry, not supported, but the BPMS is tolerant to the presence of such constructs. All right, so that brings uh, part one to an end. Is there any question?